you know, Netflix is doing better in terms of how many people it's reached because it added so many people in the pandemic, but that pull forward effect is now coming for them because it's difficult to add people and people are losing their minds when they don't. Hey gang, it's Monday, June 13th. Ross and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, the marketer podcast made possible by Marketing Architects. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by one of our senior analysts covering TV and video for us, it's Ross Benish. Hey Marcus. Hello, sir. Today's fact, there's an underwater hotel. Check this out. I'm blown away still. I spent a lot of time today researching this. Located in the lagoon at Key Largo Undersea Park in Florida, Jules Undersea Lodge is only accessible uh, to divers. Thankfully, the hotel offers training to anyone who wants to visit their unusual accommodations. They sit 21 feet underwater on the lagoon floor. Once you're submerged in your suite, you'll enjoy a lounge area, a fully stocked kitchen and bedrooms They say boast views of the fish outside. The water looks pretty murky (laughs) from what I could tell, but maybe sometimes it looks nice out there. Any interest, Ross? No, I I think I I do like swimming, but um, to just hang out underwater like that, I'd probably feel like I'm going to drown eventually. So The, the rooms look pretty small. It feels like they're in a submarine, Ah, which can't be be like living in the yellow submarine, right? Exactly. They should do a theme room like that. <laughs> that would be good. But then I started, I definitely went down a rabbit hole on this. There are, there are quite a few underwater hotels that you don't have to dive to. So there's Atlantis the Palm in Dubai. There's the Intercontinental Shanghai Wonderland, which is just a great name. That, of course, is in China. There's a, quite a few of them. Some of them look fake. They look like just the kind of mock-up 3D animations of hotels that are soon to be built, but apparently they're real. I do know that the uh, Oceano, which is that very um, fancy hotel seafood restaurant, they've got like floor-to-ceiling views uh, in a huge aquarium. That's at the Palm Jumeirah in Dubai. That definitely is real. But now I want to stay underwater. I'm surprised there aren't more of these, to be honest. I I would want to watch Waterworld starring Kevin Costner so good in the lobby of this underwater <laughs> hotel after watching that i don't think i'd uh, watching it again i don't think i'd want to be underwater because this terror is like a terrifying <laughs> concept but a brilliant movie so good anyway today's real topic is there real trouble at netflix uh netflix is losing subscribers does that mean Netflix has a problem or that streaming has a problem? Asks Peter Kafka of Recode. Ever since Netflix said they lost some subscribers in Q1 of this year, for the first time in a decade, folks have been wondering if this was a canary in the coal mine. The company went from 221.8 million users to 221.6 million. So I found from Q4 to Q1. So it ticked down slightly. That would uh, equate to uh, losing 200,000 subscribers. That's less than a 0.1% fall uh, quarter to quarter. But Ross, where Netflix stands at the moment, are you glass half full? Netflix is a video streaming leader with 221 million users, which is not nothing. Or glass half empty? They lost subscribers last quarter. I'm glass half full as far as them continuing to be the leader in streaming. I don't think anyone's going to usurp their throne anytime soon. They're going to remain one of the most influential companies in the entertainment business for some time. From an investor standpoint, that's where it'd be more glass half empty, but their market evaluation at the end of last year was probably just too absurdly high. Never should have passed the Walt Disney Company and market cap. And that's the same for many other companies. You know, like did did it make sense for Tesla to be worth like dozens of the Ford Motor companies? You know, there's a little bit of a <laughs> rational exuberance in some of these tech companies. Yeah. So you see, so Netflix, their stock was is one third of what it was at the start of the year. You see that more of the coming back down to reality, but but right. even at the where they are uh, financially, at the end of the day, they still have more subscribers than any other streaming service, and they have a bunch of recognizable hit shows that millions of people are familiar with, which is 
uh, something most of the other streamers are trying to build on right now. Netflix has you know, already done that. It's just right. tough for them to continue to grow at such a large size. Mm-hmm. So you said that their, their throne's not in danger, in jeopardy, anytime soon. Uh, they're at 221. I'm looking at some of the predictions, some of the hopes for Disney+, Plus, according to uh, their CEO, Bob Chapek, saying the company, their target to reach uh, 230 to 260 million Disney Plus subscribers uh, by 2024. So Netflix would have to basically not move at all and Disney would have to catch up. It still wouldn't catch up until uh, probably the end of 2024 if Netflix didn't move whatsoever. The problem though, Ross, is that Netflix thinks they're going to lose a further 2 million subscribers in Q2. Is that a problem? If that does happen, yeah, that'll, that will be a problem. But mm-hmm. You know, I think they'll eventually pick those subscribers back up, but it's going to be a little bit of tough oh. sliding and they'll have to uh, look for, you know, revenue elsewhere or to cut costs. Well, speaking of tough sledding and also looking for revenue elsewhere, kind of what happens next? Mr. Kafka says that a top streaming executive told him the space can expect less choice and higher prices. He says it's called the Netflix Chill, which is a play on Netflix and chill. The company has Already, you probably worked that out, but I was just, you got it. I'm glad you the spelled co- it out for us, Okay, good. <laughs> You're welcome. The company has already cut staff. More are expected. They've also uh, dumped some of uh, their existing projects uh, in terms of different shows or movies. Uh, and also, Ross, they're turning to ads for help. What do you make of this whole idea of Netflix, the Netflix chill? Do we really think it's going to be a bit of a, uh, a tough time for them? Not just last quarter, this quarter, but the coming quarters. Yeah, I do think it'll it'll be a tough time. You'll probably see a little bit more layoffs, more projects get cut, more shows get canceled as they try to be more judicious about how they spend money. If you look at in the past several years, the amount of money they spent on content and the number of questionable projects that they have greenlit is pretty out there. And that wasn't sustainable forever. I agree with the analyst that was quoted in the Recode article that you mentioned that a lot of the content in streaming, not just Netflix, but in streaming in general, was sold at a loss and subsidized by the Mm -hmm. streaming services parent companies. And it's not going to be as good as it once was for consumers. And that's kind of been the way for a while. Netflix, like nine years ago when I was in college, had the choice of content that no streaming service will ever have again. And it was way cheaper. It was an unbelievable deal. But those days are over because eventually you have to make money. You can't just add subscribers and, and that be enough. And, and that's what's going to be tough for all these streaming services. And, and their day will come too. You know, it, it's like early days for stuff like Paramount Plus, but, you know, eventually they're going to have to show profitability and will face some of the same pressures that Netflix is facing right now. Well, yeah. Speaking of profitability, do you think that the mood has changed just for Netflix or for other streaming players as well? Because Peter Kafka asks, what happens if investors decide they no longer want to fund global entertainment giants if those giants aren't going to make money? We've seen a similar thing happen with with Uber. A lot of people are getting investor subsidized rides all over the place. And now that's not the case anymore. And it's a less appealing app and offer as a result. Do you think that it's just Netflix who say, actually, we need to start making money. Netflix investors who say we need to start making money or that, you know, Disney Plus saying that we're going to make money further down the road. They're actually going to say, no, we're we're going to pull that goal forwards because of the current climate. Well, it really depends on the company. Like it it varies company by company. Uh, Amazon or Apple can afford to lose a bunch of money on their streaming services because they don't need those particular things to be profitable because they're a very tiny portion of that overall company strategy. And they use those services to drive other parts of their business. Same with Disney+. Plus. If the streaming service loses some money, that's not the end of the world if you're driving people to buy a bunch of merchandise, see movies in theaters, or go to theme parks, which Disney makes money on all those things. But if you're a direct-to-consumer streaming service and you're primarily relying on subscription revenue as your main income, then you will have the same issues that Netflix faces because you don't have the other parts of the business to subsidize it and it's not being used to drive activity into other products. Mm-hmm. 
so yeah, I mean, they are laying some people off, but it's not a ton of folks. Layoffs represent 2% of Netflix's total workforce, apparently. So things aren't as bad as it, they seem. And also with regards to Netflix losing subscribers, inflation headwinds, they're not helping, especially since they increased their prices in March. That seems like very uh, bad It's timing. also worth noting how many subscribers they have added in the last two years. Like I've mentioned this before, if we looked at our own forecasts from 2019, where we would expect Netflix to be at this point, we expected them to have fewer subscribers than they actually do now. But there's the psychology of loss that matters so much to investors. And they like to see things in percentage growth terms, even when there's a large base. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Netflix is doing better in terms of how many people it's reached because it added so many people in the pandemic. But that pull forward effect is now coming for them because it's difficult to add people and people are losing their minds when they don't. Right. Mr. Kafka cites an anonymous talent rep who had some recommendations for Netflix regarding next steps. Three of them in particular. One, they say that Netflix should market its individual movies and TV shows instead of marketing Netflix. Number two, make better movies and put some of them in lots of theatres, not just uh, some independent ones so they can win awards. And number three, stop releasing all of its shows at once and spread them out weekly. Uh, Ross, what do you make of these suggestions and what else should Netflix be considering? Well, uh, the first one, Netflix does market some of their shows. You know, if you see a Stranger Things ad, it's, it's about Stranger Things. It's not necessarily about the whole service of Netflix. So they do do a little bit of that. I don't think most of their movies are actually good enough to market on their own, though. Uh, mm. Just really not that compelling. Their series, though, are, are pretty great. For theatrical, that sounds good in theory, but... Theater revenue is still down. There are some hits like the Spider-Man movie, the Top Gun sequel right now. You see that a little bit here and there, but across the board, I don't think it's as reliable of a revenue generator as it was a few years ago, and it's going to take some time to come back. And then the other thing about releasing shows, if you release them gradually instead of all at once, you may be able to reduce churn levels. You may get people to stick with their subscription a little bit longer before you know their favorite show is done releasing new episodes, but I don't think it would do a whole lot in terms of generating new signups. Other things to do, things I've seen them consider, there's been rumors about live streaming, them getting mm. into um, sports rights or, or even stock car racing rights. They've done a little bit of licensing in the past where they've sent shows like BoJack Horseman to Comedy Central, they could become a renter of their shows rather than just a buyer of shows from studios. But, you know, th these are all just kind of theoretical things that I'm throwing at the wall that are an alternative to advertising. I'm not sure if any of them would actually work that well. Mm -hmm. And there's the gaming part. They're, they're doing gaming too, but I'm, I'm questionable that that's actually going to pay off for them. Right. Yeah, what Ross was noting there, the, the live streaming deadline recently reporting Netflix expanding into live streaming for things like live reality TV reunions and live comedy specials. Uh, also reported Netflix is bidding for exclusive Formula One streaming rights uh, in the US, that's race cars, uh, which could cost about $100 million or more. It's interesting, Ross, because a lot of those points above marketing its movies, not Netflix, uh, putting them in lots of theaters and spreading them out weekly. The article was noting that they're things traditional media companies did before Netflix changed the industry. And Alex Kranz of The Verge writing, Netflix was supposed to transform Hollywood. Instead, it's turning to the same practices that made its competitors giants, only without the lucrative franchises, fandoms and huge back catalogs those same competitors enjoy. He was also noting, Ross, uh, Alex, Crowns of the Verge, that Netflix is steering away from the frenetic release pace and mid-sized films that made it a near-critical darling with a new plan to make bigger movies at a less gluttonous pace, according to The Hollywood Reporter, also reportedly cutting back on its animation division, a space Disney already has on lock. That probably makes sense. Password sharing, Ross, I'm still not convinced this is really going to help that much. So password sharing, account sharing, which according to Netflix amounts to 100 million non-paying households spread out across the world. Visual capitalists use Netflix's US pricing as a benchmark and worked out that Password sharing translates to between one to two billion dollars in lost revenue. Last year, Netflix made 30 billion. Can this really move the needle and if they get a, a handle on password sharing? I don't think it'll move the needle in the short term as much as they need. Okay. The pace at which they are indicating that they're going to adopt ads makes me believe that they're under significant pressure to generate more revenue and to do it quickly. 
and changing up the strategy on password sharing and then collecting subscriptions from those who used to share accounts isn't something that's going to flip the switch overnight. You know, that, mm-hmm. that, would, that would take some time to right. get all those people used to be sharing their passwords. And, you know, and it's also you got to look at you would be losing some marketing, too, because right now there's a lot of people right. who are getting access to Netflix, getting hooked on their shows who aren't paying for it. And while the company isn't getting revenue from them directly, there is still benefit to the company from those freeloaders. Mm hmm. Yeah. When the Netflix cost closer to $10, it was easy to see them moving if, if they cracked down the password sharing from taking someone else's account to getting their own. But now at about 15 and a half bucks for the standard plan. Yeah, it seems like maybe that's a, a bit more of an ask, especially in this climate uh, of inflation. Ross, two more things real quick for the lead. I want to get your reaction to one more long term Netflix subscribers are cancelling their subscriptions, according to the information. Antenna survey data shows that subscribers who have been with the service for over three years accounted for 13% of cancellations uh, in the first quarter of this year. Not only that, but in Q2 of last year, people surveyed who subscribed to Netflix for less than a year, so new people, made up 70% of cancellations. Last quarter, the share fell to 60% of cancellations. So from 70 to 60, uh, basically saying that more cancellations are coming from longer term subscribers. Your thoughts on these numbers? Well, as the competition improves and there are more quality streaming services out there, Netflix is becoming a little less of a standout. For that antenna data for years showed Netflix having the lowest churn rate. The churn rate was so low, it was almost like Netflix was a utility bill that people just paid automatically. But seeing that rise just puts them at a level that is closer to the average level of churn among streaming services. Mm. And if that continues, that'll be a problem for them because they have relied on people not churning for the most part. That's something that you know made them strong and unique. Yep. And finally, Ross... This dropped towards the end of last week. Roku's stock jumped 10% amid rumors of a Netflix acquisition. Notes Colin Lodwick of Fortune. Discussions between the two companies are unconfirmed. So the idea of Netflix buying Roku. Ross, your reaction to the news? Well, it makes sense. Netflix needs advertising. Roku does advertising. Roku's having their own struggles that they may be able to paper over a little bit by combining with Netflix. But while it would get investors excited, at least immediately, I don't know if a combination would solve either of those companies' issues right now. That's it for the lead. It's time now for the halftime report. Ross, your takeaway from the first half, sir. Netflix is facing some tough times, but they still are the leader in streaming. Very good. It's time now for In Other News. The first quick word from our sponsor, Marketing Architects. TV advertising is a powerful channel for growth, but the traditional process for launching TV campaigns is expensive and complex. That's why Marketing Architects changed it. With all-inclusive TV advertising, they invest their own money to produce, analyze, and optimize your campaign. All you pay for is media setting you up for rapid growth at an extreme cost advantage. This approach is so revolutionary, they wrote a book about it. Go to marketingarchitects.com slash book to get your free copy today. Folks, we're back today in other news. YouTube is helping users interact with its apps on smart and connected TVs, and the company announced a new frequency capping solution. Story one, YouTube is releasing a feature that lets users interact with YouTube apps on smart and connected TVs by using their phone as a remote, leaning into its growing viewership on TV screens, writes insider intelligence analyst Daniel Konstantinovich. Folks open the YouTube app on their TVs and their phones and then sync the two. Then folks can do things that are typically difficult with a regular remote, like search, subscribe, and comments. Ross, YouTube's efforts to infiltrate the TV space are blank. They're meaningful. YouTube is becoming a major player in television advertising. 
Yeah, they are very meaningful. YouTube, it's sometimes easy to forget how many users they have. YouTube, so they have over 230 million US viewers this year. Netflix has 178, Amazon Prime 153 as viewers. But in terms of people watching YouTube on TV, lots of YouTube viewership happens on TV. Last year, we estimated that 55% of YouTube viewers watch the platform's content on CTVs. This year, uh, it will go to 58%, 55 last year, 58% this year. Story two, YouTube announced a new frequency capping solution, notes Insider Intelligence Director of Briefings, Jeremy Goldman. It now permits setting weekly limits on how often ads are seen, something typically done at the campaign level. Jeremy points out that the controls can be used not just on YouTube, but across all CTV inventory available through DV360, Google's CTV campaign management tool, which can reach over nine and 10 ad supported CTV households. Ross, your big takeaway from this new frequency capping solution is blank. Inadequate. It might help YouTube a little bit, but mm. the number of times I've heard people say they have a product that will solve frequency capping is uh, too many to count. And yet streaming ads are still so repetitive and painful. To a lot of people, six in 10 American OTT video viewers think there are too many streaming ads repeated during the same break or episode according to 2021 Conviva research. I don't know how that's not 10 out of 10 people. That's all we've got time for. Ross, thank you. Thanks, Marcus. And thanks to Victoria who edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening in. Follow me at justmarcus underscore btn on Twitter to say hi or just uh, to get updates on the show. Shout out to Gabby and Nico for saying hi on Twitter already. We'll see everyone tomorrow for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Marketing Architects. Who's the bad guy? It's the same bad guy from Speed, isn't he? Um, could be. It's been a while. Um, it's been a while? Come yeah. on, Ross. Yeah. Watch that yearly. Watch it yearly. You may be the only... <laughs> Uh, oh, I am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> committed fan to Waterworld. That movie lost a lot of money. <laughs> Dennis Hopper. Okay. There he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's Hopper. been in a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. Yeah.